About the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and began teaching. The Jews therefore marveled, saying, How is it that this man has learning when he has never studied? So Jesus answered them, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own authority. The one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory, but the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true, and in him there is no falsehood. Has Moses not given you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. Why do you seek to kill me? The crowd answered, You have a demon. Who is seeking to kill you? Jesus answered them, I did one deed, and you all marvel at it. Moses gave you circumcision, not that it is from Moses, but from the fathers, and you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If on the Sabbath a man receives circumcision so that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry with me because on the Sabbath I made a man's whole body well? Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Oh, West Side, it's good to see you today. My name is Cliff. I'm one of the ministers here at the church. And uh, for those of you that call West Side home, if you're a regular attender or if you're um, a member, whether it's live in person or even on the live stream, shout out to everyone on the live stream. Hey, uh, if you don't know, we're wrapping up our fiscal year. And, and uh, I just want to encourage you uh, to give and give generously. We want to be able to end the year uh, on budget. We're a little under, and uh, we're just trusting and believing the Lord in that. And so if God is stirring you up, even just as we're talking, going, right, got to Got to remember, uh, do it, uh, and uh, Lord bless you as you do that. Uh, we have uh, just a really big text uh, in John chapter 7 that we're studying. And uh, maybe just to get us all kind of on the same page, I want to start with this question. Um, have we ever stopped to consider what was going through the mind of Jesus as we uh, read John chapter 7 and we study it? Like, so for, for starters, um, John chapter 7, the backdrop is the Feast of Booths. Some, some will call it also the Feast of Tabernacles. And this is an eight-day celebration and a lot of excitement and a lot of hooping and hollering. What's unique about it is that uh, people would erect these temporary structures, these booths, and the men would sleep in, uh, in these booths. So everyone from all the surrounding area, the countryside, would come into Jerusalem and celebrate. And what they were celebrating was God's salvation, God's shelter, God's provision during Egypt's, or sorry, uh, through Israel's 40-year wandering, which is recounted in Exodus. So that's the backdrop. And what we looked at last week is uh, Jesus kind of navigating how he's going to enter into this eight-day celebration. But I think I want us to maybe just get on the same page with what was going through Jesus's mind, what he was carrying what his tension was, because uh, this scripture really pops if we, if we get that. So chapter six, uh, if we uh, remember, it was a hard conversation. Uh, it was confrontational, it was escalated, and at the end of chapter six, a lot of Jesus's followers said, I can't handle what you're saying. It's too hard. What am I supposed to do with this? And a lot, we don't know exactly how many of Jesus' followers left. What would be going through Jesus' mind as the people that he was loving and caring for, showing compassion, ministering, thought something was a little difficult and they just bounced. Between chapter 6 and chapter 7, we know that that's a six-month gap between those two chapters. Chapter 6 happened during Passover, which is the spring time, and the Feast of Booths happens in the fall. So it's six months. For six months, Jesus is kind of wrestling with what he's feeling, the, the, the feeling of abandonment. What we learned last week as well is that there was a, a threat on Jesus' life that people are trying to kill Jesus. Again, how would Jesus feel? Going, man, I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to care for and love people, and the religious leaders of the day are plotting to kill me. It, it probably started in John chapter 5 when Jesus healed a paralytic on the Sabbath day. 
and they were plotting to kill him. It started there. I think the chapter six uh, conversation uh, escalated that problem with Jesus of, of his life under threat. I wonder what Jesus was feeling. Like for six months, he's carrying this. And then his siblings are going to be going into Jerusalem for the festival. And they are giving Jesus tips on how to further the gospel, how to further his ministry. But his siblings don't even believe in him. What would Jesus be thinking that his own siblings aren't even believing that he is the Christ? And if that's not hard enough, that they're giving him tips on how to preach in a God that they don't even believe in. This is what Jesus is carrying. This is the weight that he's been carrying. And it's why he goes into Jerusalem four days later. Our text picks up in chapter 14, about the middle of the feast. Jesus went up into the temple and began teaching. And here we see the resolve of Jesus. It's fascinating. Like, I don't know how you are, but like for me, if, if I try to do something redemptive for someone, if I want to help them in Jesus' name and it doesn't go well, I'm like, hey, I tried. It's a one and done, you know, and then I kind of take it personal. I'm like, man, you rejected Jesus, you rejected me, and like, yeah, we're, no. I don't know how you are, but like, that's how I am. What does Jesus do? He quietly goes into Jerusalem, not to arouse the suspicion of those that's seeking to kill him. But he goes to the temple and he begins to teach. Why would Jesus do that? Under threat, rejection by his siblings, by his disciples, by the church leaders. Because Jesus is modeling something so simple in that Jesus is called to proclaim, right? The, the, the idea is to just proclaim the gospel message. It doesn't matter how difficult the circumstances are. It doesn't matter the opposition. It's not like, well, it's hard. Ergo, I'm going to stop doing what God's called me to do. That's not what Jesus does. He's faithful, and I'm so glad that Jesus had this resolve and that he didn't quit. Like Jesus' unbelieving siblings. By the way, so Matthew chapter 13, verse 55, we see that Jesus' brothers were James and Joseph and Simon and Jude. Matthew chapter 13, verse 56, we see that Jesus has sisters. So he has these siblings. I'm so glad that Jesus didn't quit, that he kept proclaiming the gospel because these unbelieving siblings James went on to pastor the church in Jerusalem. And his writing, the book of James, was part of the canon of Scripture. This Jude went on to be a church leader as well and went to write the, the, the book of Jude. His brother Simon was in Acts chapter 1 as the disciples are, are trying to figure out how to navigate the scandal of Judas. Jesus' But now believing brother was one of the ones that helped. Like, I'm so glad that Jesus showed a resolve and he didn't go, ah, it's hard, forget it. You rejected me, it's done. I'm so glad that Jesus didn't stop and that he had this resolve and kept going because as he kept persevering, as he kept being faithful to proclaim, in Acts chapter one, we see that there's 120 in the upper room. That was the church. And I'm so thankful that they were obedient, united and obedient to follow Jesus' command to just stay in the city and wait because you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And church, today is Pentecost Sunday. This is the day that the church marks that very day. I'm so glad that Jesus persevered and kept proclaiming because of that. It's the birth of the New Testament church. The reason why you and I are in this room right here right now is because of the resolve of Jesus. Oh, that we would be desiring to see the Holy Spirit fall the way the church did in Acts chapter two. 
Like I, I, I was reading, we were reading, uh, me and, and, and uh, some of the leaders of the church, Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit fell, they, they spilled out and just began to speak of the wonders of God and other pe- in, in, in the language of the, the hearer, the foreign language. Oh, that we'd be people that would just be full of the Holy Spirit, that we'd be able to just walk out into the city streets and not have to give political opinions, and not have to try to give lessons to whomever about whatever, but that we would just be able to speak of the wonders of the Lord. Oh, what this church would be like. Can we just pray for a moment on that? Lord, we pray for your church, and we pray for this church. That Holy Spirit, that you would fall in a powerful and in a fresh way. For those of us that are even just open-handed and open-hearted right now, willing to receive from you, would you just uh, come and and rest on us, Holy Spirit? That we would have an experience that would be supernatural, that there would be an experience in such a way that it would be so obvious that it was you doing a powerful and a redemptive work in our lives and the lives of the city, we pray. Amen. Didn't plan that. I love that Jesus showed his resolve and that he didn't quit teaching. I don't know if uh, it, it's kind of inferred throughout this text, but Jesus' style of teaching was not typical of the rabbinical pattern of the day. And here's what I mean. Most rabbis, uh, when they would teach, there was no inerrant authority within a rabbi. Like a rabbi is never going to uh, speak with any kind of authority. I, I've even uh, read in, in my study that some rabbis will go through their whole career never uh, giving an original thought. They would just quote and quote this person and that person and who they were uh, mentored under. They would never give an original thought. But Jesus' teaching style was very different. Like in Matthew chapter 5, verse 21. Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, but you have heard that it was said to those of old, so this is what he's referring to, that you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you, here's the authoritative teaching of Jesus, but I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. This is why when we read even in verse 14 that the people are fascinated. They marvel at Jesus' teaching because they're like, who is this? Like even in that Matthew chapter 5 text, Jesus was having obviously no issue with the commandment of thou shalt not murder. The issue that Jesus was having was he was challenging who would be liable for judgment and why they'd be liable for judgment. That's what Jesus was pushing back on. And so Jesus' teaching style was very unique from the day. Uh, His methods got mixed reviews. Like in our text, one of the questions was, who is he trained by? This is another reason why Jesus' teaching method was not typical of the rabbinical pattern of the day. Jesus was not formally trained and schooled by by some well-known rabbi of the day. And the people are going, like, hey, we we like what you're saying. Like, it's intelligent, it's, it's compelling, we're just not sure where you got it from, and therefore we're not sure if it's a trustworthy source. We don't know what to do with what you're telling us. And this is what's happening in this text. The people are trying to discern and trying to figure out what's happening. And Jesus had the mixed reviews because there are some people that are marveling and there's some that are going, no, he needs to die. And yet, Jesus just kept going. Like, the resolve it would take to get up in front of people and going, not sure how this is going to go. I'm going to speak authoritatively. I'm going to speak with the authority that the Father has given me. It's very countercultural in the moment. Not sure if it's going to be uh, received well or if it's going to actually incite a riot. And Jesus got up and taught. And then Jesus is addressing the, the, the issue of his authority. Let's read verses 16 through to 19. 
Actually, let's, let's start verse 17. If anyone, if anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I'm speaking on my own authority. The one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory, but the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true, and in him there is no falsehood. And here Jesus is revealing the source of his authority. It's where does he get this teaching from? He says, I, I, I get it from my Father. It's not from me. There's nothing in it from me. I, I, I'm not making this up. And it begs the question then, well, how did Jesus get this teaching? He, if he wasn't formally trained and yet he is, he's you know, speaking and pontificating in a way that's marveling everybody, how did Jesus get the information? And some of you are going, well, duh, he's God. He just changed channels to the God channel and he just got the information directly from his father. It was a supernatural endowing of, of information. And I'm, I'm not so sure if that's what it is. In Luke chapter two, Verses 41 to 52, we, we realize that Jesus grew up as just an ordinary boy. He was just Jesus from the block. I debated whether or not to say that one. <laughs> I sometimes get accused of doing one too many dad jokes. So thank you for, if nothing else, the sympathy chuckle. But in Luke chapter 2, we see Jesus just as a boy, and there's some in interesting information here. Like 12-year-old Jesus, him and his family went from the country into the city for a festival, and Jesus is in the temple talking to the rabbis. Verse 46, and we see here that Jesus is listening, and he's asking questions. Luke chapter 2, verse 52 says that Jesus grew in wisdom and in favor both with God and with men. And what we're seeing here in Luke chapter 2 is that Jesus was an ordinary boy. He was 100% human and 100% God. It was both and. But here Jesus was just normal. So then how did he, how did he know what he knew and how did he teach this amazing information? Let's, let's stay in Luke chapter 2 for a moment. In Luke chapter 2, verse 25, sorry, in Luke chapter 2, verse 25 and following, it's baby Jesus, Jesus in the manger. And Luke introduces us to two people. He introduces us to Simeon and to Anna, the prophetess. And, and Luke goes on to tell us that, uh, and this is me just summarizing, that Simeon was full of the Holy Spirit and that it was revealed to Simeon that he would not die until he saw the Lord's Christ. Simply means he was given assurance by the Holy Spirit that he would see the Father's anointed one before death. How did Simeon know that? Let's, you, in verse 30, how did Simeon know that this baby, that, that when he saw it, uh, has salvation? This is before Jesus ever opened up his mouth and before there was ever any kind of sign delivered uh, for people's consideration. How did he know that? How did Simeon know that Jesus was a light for revelation to the Gentiles? Chapter 2, Luke chapter 2, verse 32. How did he know that? How did Anna, the prophetess, know these same things? And I think this is where, uh, when we look at Simeon and Anna, we realize how Jesus must have learned and how he grew. Proximity to the Father and the Holy Spirit. That, that's what the text tells us. Communing with the Father, and because of the proximity with the Father, the Holy Spirit is going to come. And here we realize, church, that God is knowable. In the Old Testament, Psalms chapter 25, verse 14, tells us that God is knowable. 
Isaiah chapter 45, verse 5, Psalms 119, Amos chapter 3, verse 7 tells us that God is knowable. We can know God. So Jesus spent time with his Father, filled with the Holy Spirit, got to know the Father. And he taught based on what the Father was revealing to him, fully in line with the Old Testament. And Jesus is just pointing people to the Father. That, that's all he's doing. Jesus is teaching acumen and style. Though it's unique, none of it is from his own. It's his teaching. So then what's the tension? That, that seems super logical, and, and, and the people that are hearing him are, are digesting this. But here's the tension the people there would have known Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 20, and it reads, but the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods of that same prophet, shall die. And here we see a little bit of how complicated the situation is for Jesus, and it's a two-sided coin. Because you have these religious leaders on one side of the coin going, we think that he is violating Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 20. We think that he's speaking with that authority that he, he doesn't have, that he's using the Lord's name in vain. We think we're just following the Hebrew scriptures and that we're calling Jesus to death. And so what you have here is on, on the surface, it almost looks like that these people are actually uh, righteous in what they're trying to do. Matthew chapter 23, Jesus reveals what these Pharisaical leaders are like. And he, uh, through a series of woes, calls them hypocrites. He calls them child, uh, children of hell, calls them blind guides. So Jesus is uh, recognizing that on one side, you might look like you're, you have scripture on your side, but the fact is that there's a context. Your heart is sinful. Your heart is hard. And you're using scripture to justify your sinful actions. I think Jesus is summarizing the whole first part of John chapter 7 in, this, in verse 24. Do not judge by appearances but judge with right judgment. This is what's at stake here. Jesus is calling people to right judgment. The, the Pharisaical leaders are judging on appearance. And the people are gonna be hearing uh, the, the Pharisees uh, talk about Deuteronomy chapter 18 and they're like, yeah, yeah, I, I get it, I get it. What Jesus is doing in this text and what he's calling all of us is, to, is calling people to judge with right judgment. He's also pointing out that the people haven't been doing that, that they've been judging by appearances. Let's read verses 19 through to 24. Has not Moses given you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. Why, why do you seek to kill me? And the crowd answered, you have a demon who is seeking to kill you. And Jesus answered them, I did one work, and you all marvel at it. And Moses gave you circumcision, not that it's from Moses, but from the fathers. And you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If on the Sabbath a man receives circumcision... So that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry with me because on the Sabbath I made a man's whole body well? Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. And here Jesus exposes the heart of humanity. Here Jesus is exposing the nature of a sinful heart and its unreliable metrics on being able to discern what's right and what's wrong. This, this is the, the vulnerable part of the text. Because the people didn't know what they didn't know. And so they're observing, they're watching what's happening, and they're drawing conclusions. 
and, they, and they're, they're coming to these conclusions of what they believe to be right and what they believe to be wrong. And Jesus is going, can, can you trust the metrics that you're using to discern whether it's right or wrong? And here what Jesus does is he starts by exposing the sin, their sinful heart. So again, it's this eight-day feast, and we're at least day four. And everyone is involved in celebrating what God has done during the 40-year wilderness wandering. Like, it's like if maybe the closest we have is Christmas season, right? Everybody's in a good mood. And it's all Christmas cheer and Merry Christmas this and little gifts and office parties. And on the surface, everything looks wonderful. And here it's no different that there's this wonderful celebration that's happening on the surface. But underneath, they're conspiring to kill Jesus. And Jesus challenges them. And, and, and he says, you're mad at me because I, because I did one work. And what, again, what Jesus is referring to is John chapter 5, when he healed the paralytic on the Sabbath day. And, and Jesus exposes them. He gives that one work, and you'll marvel at it, but now you're doing the same thing when you do circumcision, and you're keeping Moses' law. But here Jesus says, you're trying to kill me. You're breaking the law of Moses, thou shalt not kill so again, so hey, we're, we're claiming Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 20 here. We think we're right. So what do the people do? They, they, they lie. They, they say, you have a demon. Who's doing this? And here the people are sinning even more. And they're breaking another commandment. And Jesus is just exposing their sinful heart. They could tell themselves that they're following the law with the killing part, and how do they respond? With a lie, with more sin. And they're blinded to it. Why? Because they're not exercising right judgment. Jesus goes on, and, and he pushes this a little bit more. Jesus, uh, when Jesus challenges them on this, uh, he, he's exposing uh, the, the sinful heart, and their response is, who, uh, you, 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 you have a demon. And I, I know I talk about this a lot, and I apologize, but here, what's their response is, it's this straw man fallacy again. For those of you that don't know, a straw man fallacy is when someone takes another person's argument or point and they distort it and exaggerate it in an extreme way and then attacks the extreme distortion. So when Jesus is challenging them during this wonderful feast of booze, this religious festival where everyone is engaged in spiritual activities and rhythms and practices, he goes, you're trying to kill me, you're breaking the law, and here they go, what? You have a demon. They're taking his, his point, they're twisting it, they're distorting it and throwing it back at them in a way that's gonna cause everybody who's hearing this to be on their back foot. Ooh, a demon. Who's seeking to kill you? Like, it's, it's not us, and they're, they're trying to make Jesus look stupid, and they're trying to discredit him. Jesus, the second thing he does in exposing the heart of humanity is that the heart of humanity is sinful, but the heart of humanity is, is compromised. Verse 21, Jesus answered them, I did one work and you all marvel at it. And Moses gave you the circumcision, not that it's from Moses, but from the fathers, and you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. And if on the Sabbath a man receives circumcision so that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry with me because of the Sabbath I made a man's whole body well? And really what Jesus is saying here is like, wait, wait, hang on, hang on, hang on. Let, let, let me get this straight. You're okay with the work that you do on the Sabbath, which is circumcision, but when I make a whole man well on the Sabbath, that you're plotting to kill me. That, that doesn't make any sense. That doesn't line up. That is inconsistent. 
So Jesus is not only exposing their sinful heart, it's their compromised heart. They think they're right, and they're compromised. And because of that compromised heart, because of that sinfulness, they are unable to judge with right judgment. They can't. And folks, this is you and I are the exact same boat. We can't. We don't know how. We think we have a trustworthy metric. It, it's how it looks. We're judging, but we're judging by appearances. Whatever our metric is, and, and we can't. In, in our culture, not only are we unable, we actually co- compromise our heart even more by deceiving ourselves, by giving ourselves permission to do the things that just seems right in our own eyes. Like we, we come up with modern day proverbs, while well, the heart wants what the heart wants, What is that saying? It gives us permission to follow through on whatever our heart wants. If it's hard, if it's destroying a marriage, if it's um, breaking God's laws, hey, the heart wants what the heart wants. Do whatever makes you happy. And, And we give ourselves freedom. And what are we doing? We're giving ourselves metrics that are untrustworthy. We don't know how to judge by ourselves. Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things, and it's desperately sick. Who can understand it? Our our world tells us to trust ourselves. You be you. You trust you. And here Jesus is saying, "Mm mm-mm. The metrics that you're using is, is incorrect. I'm going to ask the band to make their way up. And this is the tension of the text. Because you have people in this religious gathering, this festival for eight days, doing spiritual things, thinking they're They're all in a right place, and they're doing the right thing. And Jesus says, you don't know what you don't know. The metrics that you're using, friends, we need to figure out what is the metric that we're using for right judgment. The best way for us to apply today's text is to first of all recognize we actually within ourselves are not capable. We tend to judge by what we see on the surface. And that becomes our truth. And that's not accurate. That, that, that's not true. It's why throughout even the book of John, Jesus keeps pointing to this common thread that Jesus is the means, the lens for us to be able to judge correctly. John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. This idea of in darkness, Jesus comes and brings illumination. In darkness, there's mystery. In darkness, there's secrets. In darkness, there's, there's lies. And Jesus comes and says, I am the light. John chapter 10, verse 11, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. Like for some of us, we're like, why do we have to follow Jesus? Why do we have to do this? And Jesus says, because I'm I'm the trustworthy, I'm a good shepherd, I am trustworthy, I'm gentle, I'm lowly. Jesus says in John chapter 10, verse 9, I am the door. Like Jesus is communicating time and time again that you and I don't have to stay in this place of uncertainty, of insecurity, of whether or not we're judging correctly or not. Jesus just keeps saying time and time again that he is the way. John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way. I 
am the truth. Friends, being a part of a church does not make us exempt from incorrect judgment. Being spiritual does not make us immune to falling for different schemes of Satan. The the only way you and I can have any confidence is to fully put our trust in Jesus. And when I say to fully put our trust, I mean our mind, our will, our emotions, like I mean everything. I don't mean a salvific experience. I trust you, Jesus. We say a prayer, we go back, and we live our lives the way we've always been living, and there's no evidence of a changed heart. Jesus is calling you and I to live life with him. John 10, 10, I've come that you might have life and live it to its full. This is what Jesus is calling us to. And you and I have to come to a point where we're like, I, I'm, I'm gonna make a decision. I'm, I'm fully in, and I love how John is weaving the, this type of conversation in because he's addressing a lot of the, uh, of the insecurities and challenges that any of us would have and how we're gonna respond to Jesus' claims that he is the way, he is the truth. He is the means for us to be able to to discern right judgment. But friends, I want you to know that if you can actually fully put your trust in Jesus, it starts with recognizing we're born into sin and that we can't save ourselves, but to put our trust in Jesus' atoning death that he died on the cross in our place for our sin and he rose from the dead. That's step one. And then step two is to actually believe that when you leave that salvific moment every day, you're fully putting your trust in Jesus, that you can actually trust him. The call isn't to just pray a prayer, to have a salvific experience. The call is to live every day. And for some of us, as we're in this moment right now, we've been fooled. You you see these, these spiritual people celebrating this feast, doing spiritual activities, but they're not even seeing that their heart's compromised. I just wonder how many people in this room actually think that by coming to church and doing all of these things that they're judging with right judgment. It's not enough to just come to church. It's not enough to just say a prayer. It's to actually fully put your trust in Christ. And Jesus, throughout the book of John, abates every one of our questions and pushbacks. And there's some of you, I believe that the Holy Spirit's even nudging you right now. And you're going, I don't get it. I've made a decision to follow Jesus, but I'm feeling something. Praise the Lord. That's the Holy Spirit nudging you to move more in the direction of Jesus. Oh, that we'd be a people that would just so deeply desire to walk, to abide with Jesus to commune with the Holy Spirit. Lord, I just pray that as we just sit in this room or in our homes or wherever we are, that in this moment that there would be clarity if there's been confusion and question in how to live our lives, to live our lives with you, that Jesus, you are the way, you are the truth, you are the door, you are the good shepherd. That for some of us, it might start with actually, for the first time, committing our lives to you, to fully trust in you and your healing, redeeming, atoning work on the cross. But for some of us, we've been going through these actions of these religious, spiritual experiences, but we haven't been trusting you. Lord, I just pray that there be a desire in our heart to fully trust you, to press in to you. So Holy Spirit, speak, lead. Pray that we'd respond in your good name. Amen.